So they rehearse the next answer. Can we put our right hand? The other right hand for those. Yeah, put our right hand. Come on. I know you have a lot of pizza. Very good. Thank you. Keep it there. So the question, the question is, who is excited to see Matt here tonight here at Microsoft? Okay. Um, so um, I just need to share a bit of a quick message. Uh, all the money, the guy, the guys I, I swindled today, right, to buy all the pieces, come from this guy who managed this a product called Azure. Uh, the only thing I need to let you know is there's a very nice uh, project called uh, Project Nami. It's a uh, fork from the WordPress core, whereby uh, you can deploy it into uh, Azure platform or the cloud easily and can plug into a SQL server. Just try it out. And then uh, for those who want to help me out so I can tell my boss I actually did my work, right? <laughs> Drop me a tweet. Uh, my handle is over there. And um, yeah, all this is courtesy of the poor guy who I swindled. Uh, to buy you pizzas for the evening from uh, Azure Team. Alright? If not, I'm going to pass time back to Mike. Alright, and the other sponsor, of course, is automatic for all the swag and uh, for bringing Matt here. So, uh, and. Yeah, so actually, well, maybe just a few more words about some upcoming events. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys stay through throughout, so I just don't go through it very quickly. So, there are some upcoming events which you guys might be interested in would be uh, things like the Shashlon happening on the, on the 10th. So, uh, there's a discount code, you can get about 10% discount if you go for that. Uh, PHP users rock. So, yeah, so, and another one is uh, next week as well, there's a walkabout SG. So, if you guys cannot sign up for that, basically, it's like a uh, bunch of startups opening up their offices for, for, for you know big visitors to check out the place and all that. So um, yeah, so this is coming up as well next week. So actually, that's mm. all. That's all I have. And now I'm heading off to Matt. Oh. 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 Hello, Ma. <laughs> This guy has a lot of hair. <laughs> I don't know who that is. <laughs> Must have like a messiah complex or something. Cool. Well, uh, good evening. I'm very excited to be here in Singapore. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but this is my first ever time in my entire life in Singapore. <laughs> and I've been very impressed. It is a beautiful city. Um, I don't even know if I'd seen pictures of Singapore before. And so I was in my hotel, and I was like, well, what's a picture of Singapore? I looked it up, and I was like, man, that building looks really cool with the three stuff and like the plate on top. But I, I couldn't see it, so I was like, I wonder if they're still going to build it. Then I realized I was in it. <laughs> so not the smartest, as you can tell. Uh, so I'm very excited to share with you guys sort of the a little bit about where WordPress got started and where I got started. Um, what I've learned over the past 11 years of building WordPress in an open source way and the native automatic, and how that sort of changed my outlook on the world. 
And we'll talk a little bit about the past, the present, and maybe even the future of publishing. So that's what I got. I'm going to try to get through the talk part of it a little bit quicker so we have more time for questions as well, because I would really love uh, to hear from you guys. And also because this is probably the most English fluent country I'll be in until I go to Australia, at least. But I can never understand them. <laughs> uh, I could understand you guys way better. So we want to have a little bit more time for QA. Um, also, because we're attached with a PHP user group, I'm expecting a little bit more technical QA. So I guess we'll see. So my story begins about 17,000 kilometers from here. I converted that for miles just for you guys. <laughs> in uh, Houston, Texas. And I was born in January of 1984. And uh, from a very young age, I was entranced by music. Unfortunately, I got kicked out of piano lessons. Um, but later, I took up the saxophone, uh, like my dad. And um, that became the instrument that I, I really became passionate about. Um, but I also got passionate around this time when I was young with playing with computers. Uh, my father uh, has worked for old companies. And, you know, Houston, that's kind of what you do. Um, since the very early days, and actually got one of the first computer science degrees in the 70s from the University of Houston. So uh, there was always computers around the house. And um, I could play with them. But then if I broke it, I would have to fix it before he got home. Otherwise, I'd get in trouble. <laughs> so, but he was very, uh, it was sort of a father-son thing we did. He loved tinkering with things and you know, opening up cars and playing with them. And so we'd upgrade the computer. So we'd go to the store, buy the part, bring it home, install it, things like that. And um, this was a lot of fun. Uh, when it came time to go to high school, I was, uh, I was went to public school that's my whole life. But there was a... Um, uh, a magnet school, which means that I had an audition to get into it. Uh, it was music. So I was so worried about, well, here's what would happen. If I didn't get in, I would have to go to a Catholic all-boys school. <laughs> and I didn't want to go to all-boys school, so I practiced really, really hard. And in fact, I learned another instrument, the French horn, just because it's much less competitive than saxophone, to audition on both, just in case. Uh, luckily, I got in on saxophone. And um, it was a very unique experience. It's called High School for the Performing Visual Arts. Uh, the most famous alumni is not me. It is probably Beyonce. Uh, she went there. Uh, my prom date. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but at this point, my geekdom really started to solidify. Um, actually, outside of school, I started... Does anyone have a palm pilot here? Remember palm pilots? Yeah. Or handspring visors? They're really old school. So we started a Houston Palm Pilot user group. So rooms kind of like this every month that we get in front and we talk about like a new software. Or they actually had apps back then, uh, new plugins or modules that were coming out. I mean, they were actually physical plugins <laughs> for the handspring guys that you could plug in like a modem or like a little MP3 player. And um, then I started a computer tech club at school. Um, unfortunately, the tech club was like a band and I was almost expelled uh, for teaching hacking. <laughs> Which we weren't, for the record. <laughs> um, music lessons were expensive, uh, as much as $50 per hour. And uh, this was, you know, a lot for my family. Um, so what I started to do was barter with the musicians um, for free lessons. So I would either build them a computer or build them a website in exchange for, let's say, 10 lessons. Um, they probably got a better deal with the computer because the websites were really bad. Um, with all due respect to our sponsor, I used Microsoft Front Page. <laughs> Before it was good. <laughs> and, uh, and Dreamweaver. So it actually edited the same pages in both because like, one would get messed up and I would have to try to fix it on the other. And, uh, you know, slicing images, doing rollovers. It was uh, pretty bad static sites. But pretty good for Houston jazz musicians. Um, the folks who were adopting it were like, I was like, wow, you have a website. Um, but even then, with the static sites, it started to incorporate more dynamic aspects. Does anyone remember counters? <coughs> a little number at the bottom of the page, so it's sort of increment that everyone did. Uh, so that was probably the first dynamic thing I found on the site. Uh, later, contact forms. Funnily enough, still one of the top five plugins for WordPress is contact forms. Some things never change. And uh, then last but not least was forms. So. Uh, on one of these jazz musicians, his name was David Caceres, we set up a forum. And it became the place that all my friends would go after school. 
<laughs> like we'd all get home from school, we'd log into the forums and just kind of chat with each other. And um, I, th I think it was all Perl based at the time. The three things happened, this was my senior year of high school that sort of, uh, in my opinion, changed my life. Uh, first was I got a digital camera. And the, just the idea that I had unlimited film was very enabling. Um, the second was uh, my father got me an O'Reilly book called Mastering Regular Expressions. <laughs> this was sort of my first foray into more serious uh, programming. And you know the saying, like, um, if you have a problem and you think, oh, I'll use regular expressions to solve that, now you have two problems. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my favorite geek jokes. My other favorite geek joke, which I'll tell since this is a great the audience, is there's only two hard things in computer science. Uh, caching, naming things, and off by one errors. <laughs> the third thing was that I started reading blogs. And um, I was passionate at the time about, well, obviously music, but there weren't a ton of jazz blogs, but uh, around politics and, and economics, particularly macroeconomics, um, were the things I was into. In fact, this is kind of geeky, and I normally don't tell this, but there was a an economics competition that was a... Uh, do you guys know the concept of central banks? I don't know what the equivalent would be here. But in the US there's a bank that sets the interest rates, which then sort of sets the interest rates for the whole world. And they get together every six weeks and say, how is the economy let's set the interest rate? So this bank, it's called the Federal Reserve Bank, ran a competition every year. And in my junior year we lost, and in my senior year we went all the way to uh, nationals. And I got to meet Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, who was the uh, president of Eric Lindsay was actually our judge, and um, that was pretty geeky. <laughs> so at this point, you know, music and economics, not a whole lot of ladies or any fun. The, uh, these might seem kind of unrelated, uh, but each had a big impact. Uh, first, because I was taking all these photos and I wanted to share them with my friends, but there were no websites for this. This was like pre Flickr, pre Facebook, pre all the photo sharing websites. So that's why I started my first site. Uh, called photomac.net, which is a play on words. So it, there used to be, I don't know if you guys had this here, but there were convenience stores, and the place you would take your film to be involved was photo, F-O-T-O-M-A-T, the photomat. So the, the P-H-O-T-O-M-A-T-T -T -T was kind of a, a pun on that. There are lots and lots of puns in WordPress's history. <laughs> uh, the second, the regular expressions book, really opened my eyes to the power of programming, and particularly the power of a very short uh, line of code being extremely flexible and having a big impact. And then finally, blogs really opened up my eyes to, you didn't have to be a professional writer or a newspaper or a magazine to publish and reach an audience all around the world. And in fact, I thought, after reading blogs for a while, you kind of think, ah, I could do this. It's not too hard. Um, so I started with um, movable type. Did anyone use movable type here, just out of curiosity? I got a couple. In Japan, it's still big. That's why I'm going there next. <laughs> it's the last shot. You have your play risk, and you know you're like, it's the last country that still uses movable type. Um, so movable type was written in Perl. It's kind of a pain to install. You have to set up permissions and things like that. Um, but so I was poking around, and I came across PHP scripts. Yay, PHP. <laughs> the, um, many of them were open source. It was much easier for me to understand the templating systems and how where things were interspersed and it seemed really fast. You didn't have to mess with permissions. Um, so I switched to this software called B2CafeLog. Uh, B2CafeLog was actually the predecessor to WordPress. And it was my first real experience uh, with what later became to be the most important idea I've been exposed to in my entire life, which is the GPL. The GPL stands for the GNU Public License. It's an open source license. Um, but more than just a software license, it's also like a bill of rights. Um, I guess, I don't know if you have a Bill of Rights equivalent here. In the US, after they made the Constitution, they were like, oh, we've got some really important things, like freedom of speech, and a few other things. So they created a Bill of Rights, the Ten, Amend Ten First Amendments of the Constitution, that are really, uh, really ensure the freedom of, uh, that Americans hold so dear. So the GPL provides four freedoms. They start counting with zero because they're geeks. Freedom zero is the freedom to use the software for any purpose. Uh, one is the freedom to see how the software works, so be able to open the hood and see how it works. Uh, two is the ability to modify that software, freedom to modify the software. 
And the final one is the freedom to distribute those modifications. Uh, this might sound simple, and it is deceptively simple, but it's kind of a hack on copyright that sort of allows people, uh, software authors, to grant certain permissions to their users and also ensure that however that software is used uh, grants those same freedoms to everyone who comes down the line. So it's, it was the first, in my opinion, truly collaborative open source license. And for all of its faults, it was originally written in the early 90s and didn't anticipate, well, the web. <laughs> uh, for all its faults, I still think is uh, the best license and what I try to put all of my life's work under. So I used the software and I found it a lot more hackable and just fun than anything else. Hackable in the good sense, by the way. And so I started releasing small code modifications. Uh, they were called hacks, because the way you modify the code base was, uh, well, I'll tell you about one of them. So permalinks was one of the first ones I worked on. So what you would do is I would publish code in my blog, and it would say, open this file, go to line 22, copy and paste this code in. I go to line 48, copy and paste this code in. And as you can imagine, after you've done one of these, all the lines change. So applying the next, you're basically manually applying diffs. Uh, it gets trickier and trickier, and then it's also impossible to upgrade the software. Um, but the other thing I started doing was back to the forums, volunteering on the forums. Uh, I was very much bigger, and so I was there mostly to ask questions, but I would see people asking questions that had already been answered for me. So I would just drop in and start to answer them. And that's actually a takeaway I'd like all of you to remember, is that no matter how little you think you know, there's probably someone who knows less, and you can help them. <laughs> <laughs> So no matter how much of a beginner you are, um, the ability to help and being a little bit fearless with just trying things, I find is an amazing quality. Again, when I was building computers and things, people would pay me, not very much, like 10 bucks an hour, but they'd pay me to come over and fix their computer. And also, all I'd do is just click all the menus until I found the thing they were looking for. Uh, that and Google, you can solve almost any problem in the world. <laughs> Tragedy struck. Me too was abandoned. So the lead developer, a guy named Michel uh, Valdredi, who was in Corsica, France, and he just kind of disappeared. No one knew what happened to him. And days turned to weeks, turned to months. Uh, all the competitors to B2 uh, were adding features and evolving very rapidly at the time. Uh, but no one really knew what was going to happen with the B2 software, because it really just had this one uh, lead guy. A few of us had commit rights. You know, we had contributed enough code that um, we had gotten in. Actually, I'll tell you guys about the very first code I contributed. It was regular expressions <laughs> that, uh, that uh, we, well, it basically took normal plain text and turned it into proper typographic entities. So it turned a dot, dot, dot into the ellipses character. It turned uh, D-O-N apostrophe T uh, into D-O-N ampersand hash eight two one seven semicolon T. Because um, I was pretty anal about the talk, typography, but typing this in sort of wears on me. Um, so it was a set of regular expressions we called it texturized. So good, it'll make, so good it'll make your quotes curl. Um, and I published it. And Michelle saw it and he said, hey, if you're, if you want to, like, I think this is pretty cool. I think more people would, you know, be interested in this. So why don't you just uh, make a diff, put a patch on SourceForge and I'll commit it. And I realized I didn't know what any of the words in that sentence meant. <laughs> so I Googled. <laughs> Figured it out, made the patch, uh, uploaded it as a ticket, and it was committed. And I got this complete high, knowing that literally dozens of websites around the world were running code I had written. Um, in fact, you could characterize my career chasing that high ever since. So texturized and a few other things, but Michelle was gone. So I didn't know what to do, so of course I blogged about it. If you're ever stuck in life, just blog about it. Everything will get better. Um, <laughs> I called it the blogging software dilemma, was the title of the post. It was kind of dramatic at this age. And I said, uh, you know, B2 is stopped. Development is stopped. Other things are starting to pass it by. It'd be really amazing if you could have something that sort of took the best of all the competitors and brought it together. So the extensibility of local type, the simplicity of blogger, uh, the elegance of uh, one called text pattern, which was actually my favorite system at the time, and then the hackability of B2. A uh, fellow named Mike Little, who is also a volunteer on the forums, left a comment the next day and said, Hey Matt, if you're serious about working on this, uh, I'd like to help too. And thus, WordPress was born. Or conceived, at least. <laughs> the birth was nine months later. <laughs> we made a quick website. Um, actually, we did make a website right away because we couldn't think of a good name for it. Again, going back to naming things, being hard. Uh, 
But my friend in Houston, who was a blogger, when they called me and said, hey, and I found, I, she, well, first she called her husband to make sure the domain was available, and then she called me and said, I got this name and WordPress, and I looked at it, registered immediately, and just started working on the website. We did two things really wrong. Uh, one was on the first, I think on the very first version of the website, um, didn't really know what to put in the footer, so I put the tagline, Code is Poetry, uh, which has stuck with us to this day. Um, I was in college at this point, and I must confess I was not the best student, but one of the classes I did like was um, we were studying T.S. Eliot. Uh, does anyone know T.S. Eliot's poetry here? Check it out. It's really good. <laughs> kind of amazing. I see like two hands nodding, or head nodding. Um, T.S. Eliot's poetry is known for being incredibly dense. So we'll have a line, which is maybe like five or seven words, but then they do annotated versions of his poetry, um, where that one line will have like three paragraphs explaining it because there's so many allusions and references, or the way it sort of uses the iambic pentameter as a reference to Shakespeare, and there's, there's a lot going on there, embedded in very few words. And so, we wanted to say that, just like I've been sort of amazed when regular expressions sort of the, so much power in such a short form, that code can have brevity, but, and can have elegance as well, and can represent so much more than what's there. And also that coding is a craft. It's not just a means to an end. It's not just you know, uh, you know, something that you outsource that isn't important. It's actually, in and of itself, if you can put an attention to detail in creating things, it becomes uh, something more. The other thing we started doing, going back to the music roots, was naming the releases after jazz musicians. So the cool effect of both of these is we attracted jazz-loving people who love code. <laughs> <laughs> And very early on, so in college, my major, before I dropped out, was not actually computer science, it was political science. It turns out political science is way more useful for running an open source project. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to build alliances. <laughs> there was actually uh, a mini forks of, of uh, B2 at the time. And so I reached out to the other people who did the forks and said, hey, maybe if we work together, we can create something better. And my name's really cooler than yours, so come on over. <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, and actually, all of them, except for one, did. The one that didn't is still out there today. It's called P2 Evolution. Um, the other thing we did was, uh, well, just start working together. And uh, that's true in my life that sort of the, the best things I've ever been involved in have really been team efforts, never anything solo. And so I started bringing people together. I was writing the documentation, writing the code, answering the forms, doing blog, uh, spamming people on their blogs. <laughs> Not spamming, I would look for relevant blog entries and leave a comment recommending a better blogging solution. <laughs> the funny thing is one of the ways we reach out to folks at the time is because comment spam was a real issue. <laughs> and WordPress didn't really get comment spam, so when people would complain about comment spam, I would leave a helpful comment. <laughs> letting them know about our spam-free software. <laughs> By the way, it turns out that we weren't spam-free because we were any better. We were just spam-free because no one cared about us. <laughs> <laughs> if you, for, I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the crowd. Uh, the day when you start getting spammed is the first time you've made it. <laughs> you actually matter enough for the spammers to modify their bots to care about you. And that was not for several years of WordPress. We had this false sense of security that we actually were better in some ways, but no, it's just too small to matter. Uh, so, the good, happy ending to the earlier story, as well as Michelle came back. It turns out he just needed a few months off from the internet, forgot to tell anyone. And uh, when he came back, he was very impressed with, with what we were done, and said uh, he crowned it the official continuation of the V2 project. So it sort of became the, what all the users of V2 would upgrade to. And uh, that's basically how WordPress got started. 11 years ago now. In the early days, uh, the downside of getting lots of people involved is that um, everyone wants their 15 pixels of paint. They want their sort of option or their feature or something in there. And so early on, we started to have these uh, vigorous discussions about uh, what should be in the core or not, what should be in the core software, where lots of people want different features. Some of them I liked, some of them I didn't. It became obvious that we put all these in, we would end up being like the, the open office of, of blogging. We would just have a million dollars. Um, so in version 1.2, we created the plugin system, uh, which was, remember I talked about the copy and pasting of code? 
And we thought, well, what's a better way to do that? So those of you who are familiar with WordPress developments uh, know the filter and action system. So actions are the equivalent of copying and pasting code into a particular place so it happens automatically. And filters, of course, allow you to change the output. And uh, the plugin system is probably, um, the plugin system plus the theme system, which we did in 1.5, are the two decisions we've made that have had the biggest impact on WordPress's success, hands down. Uh, because they allow people to develop uh, pretty much anything they wanted. And we always had a resolution to what should be in core or not. We could always say, well, that's a good idea. Let's do it as a plugin first, or put it in the plugin. And also, well, there's two more things that are interesting about that. It creates a free market of ideas. So pretty much every feature we could ever put into WordPress has been done before as a plugin. Uh, so when you look at what are the most popular plugins or what's being adopted or things like that, it's actually a great, kind of like a farm team for what you should probably do in the core software. And then finally, and this is something we talked about earlier, um, WordPress, end of the day, takes some text, puts it in the database, spits it back out. It's not rocket surgery, right? Um, a smart team could probably recreate the features of core WordPress in yeah, six to 12 months. And in fact, competitors launch literally every week to do what the core of the software does. But what they forget is all of us here in this room don't use it because it is the core. Uh, we use it because of the community and the 30,000 plugins and themes. And that would take many, many lifetimes to ever recreate. So that's uh, ended up being sort of the biggest competitive advantage of WordPress in the long run, and why I believe um, it sort of was able to distance itself from its competitors at the time. Like I said, there was a lot of blogging software. And in fact, when WordPress launched, the two biggest pieces of feedback were the name sucked, and uh, there was not room for any more blogging software in the world. <laughs> um, I don't still don't forget the name thing. I love the name. <laughs> but uh, I could definitely understand why people thought there was too much blogging software. And there'd, go to the, there'd be sites that just for like letting you try out like 20 or 30 different blogging scripts. Um, but I'm glad we didn't listen to them. And in fact, they get a lot of entrepreneurs in the group. Um, when someone tells you you can't do something, uh, double down on it. Because <laughs> impossibility really only exists in your own mind. Uh, the barriers we put up for ourselves are far more powerful than what anyone else can put up. And so if people are telling you you can't do it and you start believing it, then they're right. Uh, but if you don't believe it, that's when you can. Maybe you fail anyway, and they work right, uh, but there's also that chance that you'll make it pass, as WordPress did. So we started doing the plugins, the themes, that uh, became great. I moved out to San Francisco. I got a company called CNET paid me to drop out of college. Cool. <laughs> uh, San Francisco is like the land of free air conditioning. <laughs> Houston, Texas actually has weather much like today in Singapore, uh, on a cool day. <laughs> It's actually pretty, pretty hot and lucky there. Um, so we got to San Francisco, but after about a year there, I realized I don't mind being in the Titanic, but I want to be steering. <laughs> it was very obvious to me. Cena was actually pretty anti-blog, for because uh, they were a media company. They did news.com, download.com, um, like a bunch of these websites, and they didn't. They saw blogs as, as not really a serious thing, and um, so I just wanted to. I felt like more people should be publishing the world. Um, so they're thinking of starting a company in Automatic. The idea behind Automatic is basically to say, I think nonprofits can do amazing things in the world, and for-profits can do amazing things in the world. In fact, you can point to some for-profit companies, including Microsoft, Google, Apple, is having a huge impact. But if you can create a structure where the two work in concert, I think they can do something bigger and more impactful than either could do on their own. Uh, so, we started to run into this problem where in the core software, there were things that we just weren't able to deal with. Uh, the first being anti-spam. <laughs> I, I would write plugins for anti-spam that I thought were very clever. So they insert hidden fields, or they require a JavaScript proof of work um, to submit, or they sort of randomize different things and then check it. Um, but I realized that the spammers would just download my plugins and see what I did. <laughs> And the time period of the plugins working got shorter and shorter, from being like a few months to a few weeks to at one point a few hours. And I was like, these jerks. We had to imagine his nemesis. I always called him Ivan. I imagine this guy in Russia with a beard. Like. <laughs> so what I realized is we had to create an anti-spam system that could adapt just as fast as the bad guys. And in fact, the bad guys 
had more money, uh, more resources, and fewer scruples than the good guys. So you really needed, it's almost like the, the bully on the playground. Like, unless all the good, the good kids team up, you're never going to beat the bully. So that's what a gizmo is. It's essentially a way for all the good blogs in the world to team up. And some on the edge would get spam first, but then they would report it and protect uh, the entire herd of WordPress blogs. Um, so that was the very first commercial service, the first thing that launched it automatic. Um, by the way, the original spam name of it was Automatic Spam Stopper, until we realized the unfortunate acronym. <laughs> Especially when people call it Mass Automatic Spam Stopper. So, so, uh, a kismet was a portmando. It's uh, automatic and kismet. The word for sort of a serendipitous encounter or something. Like my sister came up with that. Again, naming things is hard. I've never named anything. Uh, it's always the good names always come from someone else, uh, including Paul Fresh that back everything we did. Oh, thank you so much. Get that. And the other experiment and thing we wanted to see was, you know, to use WordPress at the time, you had to set up a database. You had to like really know how to run and administer a server. And we wanted to see if we made it sort of one click easy to start a blog where people want to do that. And that was WordPress.com. Um, spoiler, the answer is yes. <laughs> Lots of people want to publish. Um, today, to fast forward a little bit, um, it's been 11 years. We celebrated our 11th anniversary uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, WordPress now powers 22% of websites. Automatic, which uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but now it is over 250 people, and it's valued over a billion dollars. And we've been able to grow both in concert. So the company has not grown at the expense of the community, or vice versa. Uh, they've really gone hand in hand. The, and if you can imagine the sort of spectrum of how things work, you have uh, .com, which is like only or renting an apartment. It's very convenient, but you, don't, you can't knock down the walls, or they get very cross with you. And then you have uh, the .org portion, which, who actually runs .com here? Is that you're asking? WordPress.com? So a couple of who runs WordPress.org? Probably the majority. And who runs Blogger? <laughs> Go <over. laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. Um, we have an importer though. <laughs> when Automatic launched, it was actually, again, people said that it wasn't going to work because every single internet giant at the time had a blogging service. So Microsoft had uh, Live Spaces. The, the, um, was the last bit? Yeah, five spaces. Yahoo had something called 360. AOL had journals. Google had Blogger. Literally all the internet giants had a competitive blogging system. And we were just a ragtag sort of group of open source competitive uh, contributors. Um, seeing if we could do it. A lot of things, um, to talk about how what we learned from open source influenced how the company is built. And I, again, I know there's, I think Holt does a lot, I'm sure, entrepreneurs here. Uh, raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur. Like you're starting a company, you are cool. This side of the room. So I'll look over here when I tell the story. <laughs> There's a lot of things about automatic that people say is not possible to build a successful company. So, for example, we're a software company that has no intellectual property and no patents. Two of the first things that, at the time, when you walk into a VC's office, they would ask you what your IP and patents were. And Instead of being based in Silicon Valley, like every other successful company, uh, we decided to totally distribute it. Because the first couple of folks I'd been working with on the open source project for a few years, I thought, why on earth would I ask them to move to the most expensive place in America <laughs> when we have no money? <laughs> um, and we already knew we could work together in a distributed fashion. And, um, and then finally, this sort of open source uh, community plus company that we were experimenting with. Uh, but what we found is that, and this has been true with software design as well, when you're able to go back to first principles, so if you can not look at what the convention is, um, but actually look at what you believe to be true, what you can sort of logically derive from all the variables, all the, the environment of what you're operating in, um, those first principles can be incredibly powerful ways to build companies. And to be honest, the company that replaces Apple or Google isn't going to be built the same way Apple or Google is built. Uh, the next Mark Zuckerberg is not going to start a social network. They're going to start something else. 
but they're going to do it from first principles that they derive from their life experience or what they're passionate about, things like that. So uh, you can never have competitor-driven development uh, because, well, one, by definition, you're always behind. Right? They launch something and then you copy it, so it takes you some period of time. But two, um, you don't really know whether that's the thing that your users really want. A good example of this from early WordPress days is one of the biggest requests for WordPress at the time, when Google Type was still like the thing, uh, was multiple blogs. So people would say, ah, oh, I've switched to WordPress, I've only did multiple blogs. And I got very confused because I would visit their sites and they only had one. Like, where are the multiple blogs? And it turns out that uh, because of the way Google Type worked, what people were doing was they were, had the blog that was the home page, and they would make a blog that was the about page, and then a blog that was a gallery or something. So the, that was just sort of the hack they were doing with the software. So when they asked for multiple blogs, really what they wanted was pages. And so we made a pages feature instead of a multiple blogs feature, and it turns out that people loved it. So that's a good example, again, going back to first principles. So uh, again, open source can be applied to anything. I think that is the most powerful idea uh, I've been exposed to in my lifetime. And then, so in terms of what we've learned about publishing, I'd like to talk a little bit about something uh, that's coming in WordPress 4.0, if you guys are interested. Yes. 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 Well, first of all, is everyone on WordPress 3.9 already? Yes. Raise your hand if you're not. <laughs> all right, look at the people who raised their hands. Uh, the job of everyone else is to help them upgrade. Um, Really, being on an old version is like a ticking time bomb. It is a matter of time before something blows up. You get hacked, or something breaks, or, you know, it's, uh, that's why we've been building an auto-updates to the system. And actually, in the future, right now we do auto-updates for minor versions, and in the future we want to do it for major versions, and then someday we won't even tell you that we're updating. It'll just kind of happen in the background, like Chrome. Um, just think about it, like, what version of Facebook do you use? <laughs> I know, whatever version it is when you log in that morning. <laughs> so the fact that we talk about version 3.9 or 4.0 of WordPress is kind of an anachronism. So the days of, you know, uh, shrink wrap software, stuff that you'd like print in factories and then mail out to people. And over time, the, the version shouldn't matter. It should just, you should log into your WordPress and it should be that day's version of WordPress. Got a little bit to go there. And that's fact, unfortunately, not what we're announcing in 4.0. Uh, <laughs> So 4.0 is still in the development phase. It's about three months away. So there's actually still time to get involved. Um, if you're a developer or you would like to become one, honestly, there's, there's probably no better way to learn how to be a world-class PHP developer than participating in the WordPress project. Um, I say this because you can't go to, think of the big PHP projects in the world, like uh, well, let's go back to Facebook. You can't go to Facebook and say, hey, I made this modification to your homepage. <laughs> Do you mind incorporating my code? <laughs> they probably arrest you. <laughs> um, but you can go do that with WordPress. Uh, you can go to our bug tracker and make a modification to the homepage and say, hey guys, what do you think about this? And literally some of the best PHP developers in the world will read that code, give you feedback, work with it. And if it's accepted, um, you know, like I got excited about dozens of websites, 22% uh, of the internet will run the code that you wrote, uh, serving hundreds and hundreds of billions of pages every month. Uh, I think about that a lot when we're optimizing things. <laughs> like, man, if we can shave, like, just 20 milliseconds off, <laughs> like, every day that will save lifetimes, computer lifetimes, but you can save user lifetimes as well when you make things faster. So, the, uh, our plugins, sorry, I lost myself a little bit there. Um, language packs. So, one of the things that has started to realize about WordPress adoption, particularly in non-English countries. Um, our percentage in the US of websites, if you look at a GoDaddy or something like that, it's actually much higher than 23%. Um, for example, on a GoDaddy or Google, over half their sites run WordPress. Um, so what brings the average down is kind of the worldwide. We were looking at adoption was much, much lower in other countries. And uh, couldn't really figure out why. And one day it hit me like a ton of bricks that the reason people use WordPress is for the plugins and themes. And the vast majority of those 30,000 plugins and themes are not available in languages other than English. There's a lot of technical reasons for this as well. Um, there's, of course, a translation framework in WordPress. You can, um, you know, it's called a pop file. 
I don't know what they're smoking, but... <laughs> <laughs> you can submit the, the pop file that has the translations. Um, but the way that works is that to release, a, to release the... Let's, let's say you speak Greek, and the all in one SAO plugin is not translated into Greek. So you download the files, you translate it, you send it back. Um, first, uh, the developer needs to release a new version of the plugin for the Greek version to be shipped out to everyone. Um, second, that your translation is probably all Greek to him. He doesn't speak Greek, so he has no idea whether the translation is any good or not. There are volunteers uh, who know whether that translation is good or not, the Greek translation community, but they're way over here, and they're not involved at all with that submission. Um, we had an interesting bug like this once in WordPress, where we, uh, we had a community translation system, and in the Spanish translation, we started to get these support requests, and they said, uh, on under my blog post, it's it's a uh, well, someone had replaced the comments zero, so instead of saying zero comments, it said happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so under every blog post, it would just say happy birthday, happy birthday. Which <laughs> is kind of nice when you think about it. <laughs> Could have said something way worse. But, uh, there's the potential for that sort of uh, equivalent. Um, so what language packs do, they completely decouple the translation from the software itself, for both core plugins and themes. So what that allows, first and foremost, is Oh, when you're setting up WordPress, it'll be like kind of like when you set up OS X. Like the first thing it asks you in its respective languages, what language would you like to use? And you can click on that, and uh, and the rest of the install process will be in that, either English or. Um, the uh, what it'll then do is it'll go out and download that file. The language files actually can be quite quite big, um, so it'll sideload that into the installation. And then every single plugin, so the Jetpack plugin, that downloads down like 13 megabytes. Um, 12 megabytes of that is the translation files. So those will now be separate. Um, and when you log in, the in dashboard plugin and theme directory, so the browsing when you do searches and everything, will only show you things that are already translated into your language. Of course, if you speak English, like most of you do, or are probably very confused right now, and my thought. <laughs> <laughs> You can always see the others, but for the vast majority of folks where they're not comfortable or maybe don't speak English, uh, having this completely native experience I think is going to be really powerful. And these directories will also be like on for Indonesia, id.wordpress.org. Like, that'll have the Indonesian plugin directory. And maybe it's just a couple dozen plugins to start, but that'll start to grow and start to grow. My dream is actually that someday some of these countries are, have such vibrant communities that we're translating them from their language back into English. There's you know a thousand you know, Japanese WordPress plugins or Indonesian WordPress plugins that we want to use, and so the translation teams go in the other direction. I think that would be uh, so cool. Our mission is to democratize publishing. That means to provide the equality of opportunity, not just for folks who speak English in America or live in San Francisco, but for everyone, regardless of how much money they have, regardless of what language they speak, and regardless of their technical ability. We want to enable them to have not just a website, but a beautiful web that expresses their creativity and uniqueness as a person. And the other thing I'm really passionate about is I want a majority of the web to be powered by open source software. When I see the 22%, I don't think, yay, 22%, I think, ah, 78% to go. <laughs> There's a lot of the web out there, and I would say we're in a time where more and more is going to proprietary software, proprietary services. Myself, and hopefully now you in the room, care about the philosophy of, of open source. The freedoms are important. We understand what happens when those freedoms get taken away. Uh, to which of the Ben Franklin quote, those who would trade freedom for convenience deserve magic. Um, but most people in the world don't care about the four freedoms of the GPL. They just want something that works. So if we're going to get a majority of the web on open source software, we need to create something that works and works better than all the proprietary competitors. There is going to be a quarter of a billion dollars spent on advertising in the U.S. this year alone against WordPress. A quarter of a billion dollars. That's a lot of moolah. There were Super Bowl uh, commercials for Squarespace and some of our competitors this year. It's more aggressive than ever. Um, from the best we can tell, there's about a million dollars spent on WordPress advertising last year. So a little bit of a big delta. But why? Um, these guys are advertising because they have to. They don't have you. The smart and beautiful people here in this audience 
that are sort of the, the leading edge adopters of, of this open source software and understand why it matters. The community is the secret ingredient of WordPress. And that's why I'm, you know, traveling throughout Asia and not sleeping to try to meet as many of you as possible and sort of spread the good word. So uh, that's what I got. Thank you very much.
Korea consumes more alcohol per capita than any country in the world, including Russia. In fact, they are more than double than Russia. Uh, Koreans consume 13.7 units of alcohol per week, where in Russia it's just 6.5. <laughs> I was quite impressed with that, to be honest. <laughs> um, LiveJournal was huge then, and LiveJournal actually has been a huge influence, especially on WordPress.com. Uh, Brad Fitzpatrick, I believe his name was. Um, LiveJournal was one of the first sort of web scale services that open sourced a lot of their infrastructure. So Memcache, uh, Mobile LFS, software that we actually still use to this day, originally came out of LiveJournal. Um, and Actually, it was what all my friends were using. <laughs> so a lot of my friends were using my channel, too. Uh, I didn't mention it in the post because it wasn't something that you could download or run yourself. And I was really focused on sort of self-hosted software at the time. Uh, in terms of Russia, uh, it's interesting because the word they use for blog there is live journal. They're like, I have a WordPress live journal. <laughs> uh, it's actually, in Texas, for those of you who ever go, uh, the word we use for all softwares is Coke. So you say, can I have a Coke? And they say, what kind? You're like, Mountain Dew. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Like, that's just what it is. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I think that it's a tricky market and one I don't understand. We do have uh, a few employees there. Um, and with the open source, there are some good open source contributors there. But I haven't really looked at it as a market that we're going to try to aggressively expand it. Um, the, the markets I don't pay attention to are the ones where we're doing really well already. So, like the United States, UK, New Zealand, um, uh, or the ones where it seems so impenetrable that I don't even know how to get started, like China and Russia. Um, so, the ones I paid attention to are the ones I'm visiting on this trip. <laughs> so, Korea, Indonesia, Singapore, Japan, uh, Philippines in Asia, and then Australia, and New Zealand I'll go to as well. Um, why those countries? Thank you for not asking that, but I want to answer it. <laughs> uh, first, because they all have really interesting WordPress communities. I mean, Lester and the crew here, and look at this, this is amazing. Thank you for coming here. Round of applause for them as well. Um, two is we're hiring. Uh, we're going to hire over, probably about 150 people this year, and um, I would love to hire uh, anywhere from one to ten people in each of those countries. Uh, so, including Singapore. Uh, Singapore is pretty nice, but it, like in Indonesia, people are like, "Wait, I don't have to commute." <laughs> First traffic I've ever been in in my entire life was in Jakarta. That was incredible. <laughs> Just the level of not moving. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, Indonesian is our third largest language for WordPress. It goes uh, English, uh, which, I, you know, we started there, so that's obvious. Spanish, which covers like 20 or 30 countries, so that's not that surprising. And the number three is Indonesian. Head of Germany, head of France, head of a lot of other countries. Um, my host told me that part of the reason they did study, part of the reason Twitter is so popular there, is because they're in traffic all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it was kind of cool. So my goal is for WordPress to be something you can use in traffic. <laughs> Not while driving, of course. <laughs> Only if you're a passenger. Um, so the, the hiring each of those, I think, is going to help us really, uh, because no matter how much I time I spend in some of these countries, um, I'm not going to understand the same way someone who's lived was born there and lived there and really understands the culture really deeply um, and the language really deeply and everything like that. So we're excited to see that and how that develops. Uh, right now, Automatic only has three employees in all of Asia. Uh, one in Japan, one in Sri Lanka, and one in uh, India. So, but we, like I said, we're totally distributed. So we're now across 35 countries and 190 cities. People just working from home, setting their own hours, uh, kind of doing their thing. Uh, right there. Hello, uh, my name is CJ. I just got a little question. Um, is automatic is WordPress still on a VM? Yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 
This is an interesting question. So there is a, if you mean core WordPress, um, there's a full mirror of core WordPress on, on Git. So if you would like to use WordPress from Git, um, you can. You can submit pull requests, you can do everything with it. It's on GitHub, actually. Uh, core development is still kind of SVN centric. Um, there's just a lot of tools we have built in there that are kind of tied into it. Um, same thing, excuse me, for WordPress.com, a lot of the core development is still on SVN. Now that said, most new stuff and most smaller stuff, uh, we've moved over to GitHub. So all the mobile apps for WordPress, we have an iOS and Android app that are very active and Windows and BlackBerry apps that are inactive. inactive. Um, <laughs> but it, there's nothing, it's just we had to focus in. Like, because our mobile apps were not doing well, the ratings were really low, and we the team was spread too thin. Um, those are all on GitHub. And also plugins like Jetpack. A lot of the new stuff we're putting out there is on GitHub as well. So uh, it's actually been pretty cool. Jetpack in particular gets a lot of cool for us. So uh, there will be more Git in the future. <laughs> Yeah, I think so too. Thank you. Uh, I'm going up there. Our blogger user. Oh. Hi, uh, I'm Sahil. So, what do you think of static site generators like Jekyll? Do you think they're a threat or something? Um, and I've actually written static site things like that before. Um, I've actually written like half a dozen CMSs in my time. Uh, it's kind of an obsession of mine. If WordPress were away, I'd probably work on another one. Um, it doesn't... It's very... Philosophically, I kind of like the idea of everything being static files and working without a database and kind of uh, being around potentially forever. But if you look at it, often the trade-off these sites make is, you know, it's a false simplicity. So. Yes, the site is in Git, and that's very nice, but then they're putting the comments on Discuss. Or they're starting to sort of outsource basic things about it. And I, I, I believe that comments are actually just as important, not more important, than the post itself. And so, okay, well now do you have sort of a dynamic script that then takes the comments and rebuilds the files. Um, congratulations, you just reinvented a movable type. <laughs> <laughs> and that will get slower and slower over time, but based on how you need to rebuild things and stuff like that. Um, also, they can slow down when you get to thousands of, of uh, thousands and thousands of entries. Now, all that said, uh, a lot of the reason the only thing I think they're totally fine, and they're if you like using it, if you like whatever you like publishing, like publish with that, because publishing is still better than not publishing. I don't know what you're using, even if you're on Blogger. Um, <laughs> the the one argument I strongly disagree with is that it's the the speed argument. Um, WordPress with caching, WordPress with HHVM out of Facebook, like, you can make it just as fast as essentially a static site. Um, there's a difference, but it's like the difference between like 130 million requests per day and like 110 million. Like, it's so far beyond what anyone actually needs that it doesn't matter. Um, WP Supercache is, is a, WP Supercache and one we call Backcache are my two favorite plugins for caching. And, uh, and you drop them in and you get really far really fast. Uh, generally the bottlenecks stop being at that point serving those files, which are essentially static. Um, but something else in the stack, you know, misconfigured, you run an app reports, uh, misconfigured networking stack, things like that. So we scale a lot of, WordPress.com is, is a top 10 internet site in the world. And so we see, and it runs the same software that you guys can download in, from WordPress.org today, uh, plus a few plugins. Uh, how about over here? Uh, hello, good evening, uh, Mr. Man. Uh, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I'm in Mission and currently supporting the Japanese uh, infrastructure as a support WordPress. Cool. Okay. Uh, basically, what I want to know is how you are interested in the business of the infrastructure as a, uh, as a service, especially the Japanese users that collaborating, as in, you already say that they have a community there, huh? but uh, on the managing part itself, uh, WordPress as a, as a service, something that uh, we just provide the WordPress and then, you know, let the uh, user customize by itself, uh, but then uh, it's done out that, let's say WordPress doing some updates, 
the previous updates is not working, so on and so forth, so something like, you know, how the WordPress is going to communicate uh, to the users and especially to the, to the providers, yeah. the providers, especially the infrastructure or something. And the second part is, um, is it as in automatic invested directly to have their own infrastructure here in Singapore? That's oh yeah, I forgot to say that. So we're actually building a data center in Singapore. Woo! 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 Uh, so things should get much faster for you guys. Uh, um, WordPress.com runs primarily, and that includes Jetpack and Kitman and everything, it's primarily out of three data centers, all of which are located in the US. By the end of this year, I believe we will have 19 secondary data centers around the world uh, for caching and speed and things. Um, in terms of how to communicate and how to connect with the local communities to sort of keep them abreast of the changes that are going on, uh, language packs, I think, are going to have a really big impact on that because it puts more of the power back to the translation community. They become the moderators for all the plugins and the site and everything like that. And um, Andrew Nason, who, if you're involved with WordPress, you probably come across him, uh, is fully focused on this problem right now. So we're working a lot. Many of the local translation packages have kind of a hacked version of WordPress. So they make certain modifications to the core software. Um, we're trying to eliminate all this. Not by saying you can't do it, but by just saying, Let's, that's a bug. Let's fix it. So you don't need to have any hacks there. It can all be done through the language file. And, um, and then that sort of becomes what I hope is the, the first domino. And the local community is becoming a lot, lot stronger than they currently are today. Um, but if you're, there's also, well, we like funny subdomains. So if you go to make.wordpress.org, uh, if you ever want to get involved with WordPress development, that's kind of the help for it. Um, there's a number of P2s there, sort of blogs where we communicate with each other. And we've been trying to use the blogs to communicate better with the, the language uh, maintainers, if you will. Um, but I think that there's a big burden on them. You know? It's a lot of, they wear a lot of hats. They're translating the website, the documentation, the software, the uh, everything. And so, um, I honestly believe there's too few of them today. They're very passionate. They're some of the most passionate WordPress users in the world, and some of my favorite people to hang out with when I travel. Um, but there's just a little bit too much on their shoulders because they're essentially trying to recreate the work of what's dozens of people on the English side. So uh, hopefully, once the English packs get out there, we'll start to grow that community. Thank you, and thank you for your contributions as well. Bounce back over here. Uh, how about I think we took the mic away from you, so I apologize. So you can have it back now. Hi, thanks. Hello. Yes. Hi, my uh, Aaron. Um, so WordPress is a great on tool. It, it, it's fantastic, but I think more and more of us are seeing. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we are beginning to see WordPress um, growing to beyond just blogging tool. It's being used uh, in a lot of different ways, websites and different uh, web, web 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 applications. Um, so where do you see WordPress coming in? Um, say five years down the road, where, what's the next step are we moving towards? Uh, where application for you? Yeah. Yeah, you kind of answered it. And so there's two big things that I think are going to change in really interesting ways with WordPress over the next five years. Um, one, I think in five years, the majority of WordPress users will install it and primarily maintain and interact with it from a mobile device, such device. Uh, either that or we probably won't exist. So what are the other two things? <laughs> Um, and in terms of how people are using it, uh, WordPress has really had two phases in its history. Uh, it started as just a blogging tool. And in fact, our competitors still say it's just a blogging tool. But in fact, uh, we later, with the advent of pages, became a lot more of a CMS and custom post types and things like that. And in fact, when we're surveying now, 92, wow, that's a lot of water. <laughs> Spray it out there. <laughs> It is kind of hot, maybe I can. 92% uh, of our users use it as a CMS. Um, so maybe when you say WordPress is more about blogging now, it's just, it just has no connection to reality. Um, what the CMS side of it was doing kind of in 2007, I'm now seeing happen with what you refer to as the application framework. And so for those of you who aren't familiar, this is people using WordPress, like you might use a Django or a Rails, uh, to build something that isn't necessarily the output, isn't even always a website. Sometimes it goes straight to a mobile app. Um, the thing that I think is going to be very, very interesting there is the work we're doing around APIs. Mm -hmm. So both on WordPress.com, uh, through Jetpack, and in Core, 
we now have these series of REST APIs, uh, which are very modern, performant, you can embed them easily. Uh, we're, I think, in a few days, going to create a, or release a sort of JavaScript library for interacting with the .commons that works from both Node on the server side and on client side as well. The, uh, the new versions of WordPress are essentially going to be more and more clients of these APIs. So I can imagine a day when, well, I can't imagine, we're going to have a day when 95% of the code in WP admin is JavaScript interacting with these APIs. What's interesting then is now that you have sort of a, a defined interface for these things, it's entirely possible for someone to create like a Python version of those APIs. You know, as long as the, the inputs and the outputs are the same, there's nothing that even doesn't have to be PHP anymore. You get an interesting sort of like the paradox of PC is just ship. Like at one point, it's not WordPress anymore. Once you change, do you guys know that? I should probably see. The paradox of PC is just ship, it's a, it's a poly <laughs> It's a, a Theseus sort of set out, I think it's in the Odyssey, and, um, and along his voyage, they end up replacing every board of the ship. So the, the question, the paradox is like, at what point is it still Theseus' ship when every sort of component part of it has been changed? So at what point when every single line of WordPress has been changed in it, and it's now JavaScript, more JavaScript application than the PHP application, is it still WordPress? And uh, I think well, it's as long as you guys in the room are still there. <laughs> um, that sort of being a client of the API, I think will allow some really cool things to be built on top of it. Uh, there's two that are out there today. One's called postbot.co, and one's called sulfur. Um, these are built on the .com API. Postbot is just a really sort of single purpose client for WordPress that allows you to take like gallery photos. Like let's say, I actually did this, I did about a month's worth, about a month and a half ago. So let's say you have 30 photos, just drag and drop them all, and it creates basically a post for each one. It allows you to schedule them, caption them, move them around. Um, basically, it look like you're blogging, even if you're not. Oh, the beauty of it is like, I don't know about you guys, but I have bursts of inspiration. So sometimes I'll blog a lot, and I'll create like five blog posts in a day, and then like nothing for like weeks at a time. So what I try to do is spread those out, and that's kind of what PostBot does. So this is a good example, and the guy built it in three or four days. So it's a good example of what can be done with these sort of robust new APIs. If you are either learning to code or want to up yourself as a developer, if you're a PHP person, um, the more JavaScript you can learn, I think the more valuable uh, your skills will be in the future. Because it's not that, I think still think PHP is probably the best web language for massively deploying things. But just more and more of the interesting stuff is happening on the client side with JavaScript. And with things like Node, you do some amazing, amazing stuff. Um, we also, Automatic is a big supporter of Node now. In fact, we, uh, has anyone seen Socket IO? Socket IO 1.0 uh, came out. And if you go all the way to the bottom of that page, it's got a little Automatic logo. Ooh, thank you. Uh, we can bounce back over there. Richard. Hi, hi. Yes, yes. Hi there, my name is Ideo. I have two questions regarding uh, WordPress security. Uh, any plans to incorporate WordPress security best practices into the installation process? For example, like... Uh, into the what? Into the installation process. Ah. Yeah, for example, uh, making the user change uh, database name, for example, during the initial uh, installation of WordPress. And then perhaps other best practices. Second question uh, regarding the increasing popularity of uh, managed WordPress hosting. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned you're going to have a data center in Singapore. Any plans perhaps to offer a managed WordPress hosting with security as a top priority so that you know bloggers can focus on the blogging aspect instead of having to worry on the security aspect of WordPress? Because we, I notice WordPress do get a lot of uh, brute force attack and hacking and all that. Thanks. Uh, we are going to do that and we're going to call it WordPress.com. <laughs> I'm kidding. I know, so there's managed show stuff. There's like WP Engine and things like that. Uh, we're not going to move into that space. I think that those guys do a good job. Uh, but at the same time, WordPress.com becomes more and more powerful every day. In fact, the business version of WordPress.com, you can actually execute arbitrary JavaScript on it. So even though you can't modify the PHP, you can actually do some pretty interesting things with, between webhooks and JavaScript. Like you can create a site that you might otherwise need to uh, get hosting for and hosted on the cloud, which is, of course, extraordinarily secure and not infinitely scalable, but you really have to 
push some traffic across the nose. Um, in terms of the best practices for security on installation, uh, there's probably hmm, the database thing. I don't know if that's that's something that we should do, but we have been incorporating more and more. So, for example, uh, the username admin is no longer the default as it was for many years. We now encourage a different uh, thing. We're starting to be better about enforcing passwords or checking emails online. Um, long term, I would like for WordPress users not to have to worry about that much. So things like changing names or hiding the version or stuff like that, they're, uh, they're not particularly effective against a smartly written script that's trying to export things much less a determined, you know, targeted exploit. So, it really becomes, what are the things we can do that can... And obviously, if we did that before, the scripts would... Again, it's like my anti-spam plugin. <laughs> the day after that comes out, all the scripts that hack things would just say, okay, here's how we check for different database things, etc. Um, so, it, it, we try to think about things... Uh, a good way to think about security, particularly web security and the wide scale, is as club or lojack solutions. Now, I understand you're a very low crime here, so you might not know what either of those are. <laughs> I will explain them. Um, a club is a thing you put on the steering wheel of your car. It's like an extra lock. And it's like this big metal thing, and you like open it up, and then you lock it. And um, that's that. And a lojack is something that they install on your car, which essentially has like a GPS locator. And so, uh, what's a club versus Lojack solution? Well, it turns out that a club doesn't actually make your car any more secure. If they can get in the key to your door, they can probably get in the key to this little metal thing, you know, $20 metal thing on the, on the steering wheel. But it does make your, so if someone wants your car, it's no more secure. It might slow them down for 30 seconds. But if someone just wants to steal a car, it is more secure. Because they peek in the window, they say, this guy has a club, this guy doesn't, I'm going to go to the guy who doesn't, because it'll save me 30 seconds, or a little bit of hassle. Um, so it makes you more secure, but it doesn't make the system more secure. Lojacks, actually, when they're widely installed, lower crime in an entire neighborhood. Because what it does is the criminals don't know whether a car has Lojack installed or not. So it kind of increases the cost for everyone, for all the bad actors, of the bad action, which is stealing cars. And then also leads police to the source. So when they take the car to the chop shop or whatever, you know, they know where that is. Um, so in security, it's interesting. One is not necessarily, there's nothing wrong with club solutions. You just have to be sure to know what they are. So sometimes we get submissions like, uh, kind of going back to the stuff I originally wrote, like things we could do to fight comment spam and core. Um, but all they really do would make it a little bit harder for certain blogs to be spammed than others. And then as soon as it was widespread, Everything has an equal cost, so it doesn't really help in the long term. So some of that database stuff and some of the things that are reported as best practices, um, I think are club solutions, not Lojack solutions. And keep that in mind. It's actually probably the best uh, framework I've been exposed to for thinking about uh, web security, or security in general. Ooh, on this side, how about uh, in the back, and then we'll go to the front. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Brandon yeah. here. Um, yeah. uh, actually, I've got two questions for you. The first one may not be related. You guys <laughs> love two questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so here it is. Um, have you been approached by any for WordPress.com? Have you been approached anyone to install specific software or hardware, wiretapping hardware onto your servers? <laughs> <laughs> What's the second question? And the second one is basically WordPress.com. I'm, really, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about the popularity or, or how it's going it's to gonna sort of um, continue to be more e e e economical. So what I do suggest is that perhaps convert it to a full-fledged PHP hosting server instead of just um, using WordPress on, on, on that multi site. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. So, so that... Um, it gives you the more flexibility as long as it's PHP, then they may be able to switch from Joomla or maybe, or maybe um, Drupal as well. Yeah. It, it's worth considering. Uh, so I'll do the first one first. Uh, not to my knowledge. But as, I mean, Google didn't know either. Um, the, 
yeah, the NSA stuff is super crappy. Like, I was uh, kind of shocked when all those revelations started to come out. And um, fortunately, WordPress is a publishing tool. <laughs> so we don't have a ton of private information. <laughs> uh, besides, you know, maybe like your login, um, really most of what people put on the WordPress is later published on the web. So you could, it's probably easier to crawl it than it is to tap our private cables. <laughs> <laughs> that said, um, we are fiercely on the side of user privacy. So we are doing all the things all the big companies do, encrypting connections between data centers, etc., uh, to at least make it harder and more cumbersome uh, for someone to look at our data, even though most of the data, 99.9% of it is public already. Um, so that's where we fall there. Uh, but yeah, as a broader issue, I think that's Oh, the Snowden stuff like really shook me um, in terms of just the, the implications it has for the U.S. and how I perceive the U.S. and the internet to interact, and also how I perceive like our democracy to work. And so, the good news is that there's vigorous discussions happening about all these things, and I hope that our political process will bring us to the place which is both better for well, American citizens, but also for the whole world. Um, it's it's kind of funny in all these debates. A lot of the questions about legality um, only apply if you're inside the borders of America and the American system. <laughs> Basically, say if you're one of the 6.9 other billion people in the world, tough luck. <laughs> uh, you have no right to privacy or no anything. Um, and I do believe that when a society is surveilled, it changes its tone and tenor and how the people operate, uh, almost as like a hidden cost in the psych psychology of the people, which. Um, is corrosive and toxic. So, um, free society should not be surveilled, um, whether they are ours or someone else's. Uh, WordPress.com becoming more general PHP host. Uh, there's a lot of people who do that well. And to be honest, I feel like that space is, is going to be commoditized more and more every day. As uh, Amazon, Google App Engine does PHP now, uh, Azure, Rackspace, you know, the cloud platforms get better and better every day. And all of them support WordPress, including Azure, which is cool. And, um, and so the actual hosting, I think, goes to zero. Because most people's traffic grows slower than Moore's Law. So, <laughs> so by definition, uh, it will get cheaper and cheaper to do whatever you're hosting every year. Um, so that part, the service has become a lot int more interesting. Um, supports, uh, things that are above just the raw hosting. And that's where we really try to focus our business. Um, because those are the things I think are going to remain important over the next 5, 10, 20 years. Thank you for your questions. We had uh, right in front. Hey, man. Thanks for uh, coming to Singapore. Um, no I'll hold you two questions. One's kind of like hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a two for one deal here. I love it. Come on, guys. Come on. Um, is that like a bargaining thing? <laughs> it's. Um, I'm actually not from Singapore. It's, um, <laughs> what is it? it's um, shopping month or something like that. This month, uh, <laughs> Singapore. Singapore, that's right. Yeah. So everything's on sale now. Um, but anyways, uh, first question: um, Did you plan your trip to Asia uh, to be away from Texas during DrupalCon? <laughs> <laughs> um, but on a more serious, serious note, um, so what's your thought on other uh, CMS uh, packages out there, the open source ones like uh, Drupal and Joomla? Mm -hmm. Do you view them as threats, competitors, or do you kind of feel that uh, you know you guys can learn from each other? Oh, those two. Sorry, those are the two. No, no, concrete five, okay. uh, whatever. No, you no, know. no, I mean like two questions. Yes, okay. yeah. You don't have to answer the first one. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's funny. The, so Trees is actually a friend. Like we text to each other, and we've uh, we've kind of grown up together in terms of. Uh, I think I'm one of the first. 500 or 1,000 users on Drupal.org, if you look at my username. So we were both kind of around each other's orbits uh, from really the very beginning of both of our projects. Um, so in terms of the open source guys, let's call it Joomla and Drupal being the other two big ones besides WordPress. Uh, they're comrades in arms, but also competitors. Like, I want to create better software than them, full stop. But they're also, they're not the bad guys, and that they're also GPL PHP software. Um, and there's things that communities can do learn from each other. Uh, I've been invited to DrupalCon many times, I've never made it. 
But I did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> busy guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you invited me to uh, the WordPress conference? <laughs> um, I don't, maybe. I don't know. But I did keynote the Joomla uh, World Conference uh, just last year. And I was like, is this a trick? Is this a trap? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. And um, the, the truth is that uh, WordPress has had a lot more mainstream adoption than both of those packages. And so I have opinions on why. And I don't, I'm not shy about sharing these. And um, so it's, it's cool to engage with those communities and, uh, and talk about that. Also, the interesting thing, when I was at the Joomla conference, probably about half or two thirds of the people also made WordPress sites. So it wasn't like it was an either-or thing. It's that they're using all of them. And maybe for different projects, something might be better. Um, I use WordPress for almost everything, but I'm pretty biased. <laughs> there's, a, there's, I believe, first and foremost, in the right tool for the right job. And um, the, uh, we are making WordPress the right tool for more and more jobs every day. But you know, one thing that's important is what you know best. If you know something really well, I get that asked this a lot. There are people come to me to say, ah, oh, man, my engineers want to write something in so-and-so, but I heard that this language is cooler. I was like, well, you probably should do it in whatever your engineers want to write it, because they're the ones writing it. <laughs> and they're going to have to live with it, and they're going to have to maintain it, and everything like that. So the thing that they know and want to do is ultimately going to be better for you in the long run, rather than forcing sort of a different thing on it. Um, in terms of what I think of them, I'll mention those two, because I have probably the most, most familiar with those of all the others. Um, they're both good guys. Oh, so who are the bad guys? The proprietary ones. Squarespace, Wix, Weebly, uh, Sitecore. It's just proprietary software. And I believe that that makes the web a fundamentally less open place. And also, I'm shocked at the amount of money people spend on these things. Um, it's literally criminal. <laughs> Particularly what government spends on proprietary software. Um, this is something I... I advocate for, I go to Washington, D.C. a lot now. Um, something I advocate for quite a bit is, as a taxpayer, why should what my tax dollars pay for, in terms of software, not belong to me as well? Why are we giving $20 million to Oracle instead of putting $20 million into an open source database? Um, WordPress has been built on just a couple million dollars. Like, can you imagine what the yearly IT budgets of different countries even if it's just a small percent, one or five percent, when the open source the impact that would have on the internet, it would be shockingly amazing. Um, so the extent anyone has any influence with the Singapore government or the IDA or anything like that, um, advocate for this. It's actually a very apolitical thing. The only people who are going to fight it are people who sell proprietary software. <laughs> but to be honest, like they can, there's no reason they can't sell open source software, or open source services as well. They're really good at selling, you know, millions of dollar contracts to the government, so they can continue to do that. Let's just have the software be open source as well. Um, so Drupal, I think, is... So what I don't like about Drupal, what I love about Drupal is its community. I think it is as robust as uh, WordPress is in many ways, and bigger in some ways. They have way more consultants, Partially because it costs a lot more to make a Drupal site. <laughs> so it supports a lot more people making those sites. <laughs> um, and I think that's the downside. So their strength is also their weakness there. Where because so many of so much of the community and so much of the economic activity in Drupal is driven by um, the creation of sites, which typically are hundred thousand dollars plus, and the maintenance of them. So when a new version comes out, it is often not backwards compatible. So upgrading it is another thing you pay someone for. Um, there's not a lot of incentive to make either of those things kind of completely hassle-free in the community. So um, there's no one in the Drupal community I'm aware of that advocates for what we're trying to go for, where auto upgrades. And in Joomla, I feel like they made a mistake around uh, the GPL. So they um, had sort of an on-site directory of paid plugins and themes and everything like that. And sort of what happened is that people who might prior previously collaborate, like you're making a plugin, I'm making a plugin, they do roughly the same things, we start working together. Because they each had sort of a, an economic selfishness around it, we're both going to do our own plugin because you know, it's too difficult to figure out revenue sharing or something like that. So what this happens is this balkanizes development. It takes people who would prior collaborate and they start sort of being more interested in their own thing. And it creates 
really a tragedy of the commons. So um, for a couple of years, Truma did that, and I feel like it, it set them back a bit. So, uh, but very functional software. It does everything. Cool. Any questions? Questions? Where are they? That would be the last one. Uh oh. Is it a good one? <laughs> Hi, I'm Alan. Um, what are your general thoughts on WordPress and open source in general regarding the state of the mobile internet, considering how dependent we are on native proprietary code, and how the mobile web is now being redefined by some pundits as Hey, um, your mobile apps have HTML wrappers and whatnot anyway. So I think we're in a very uncomfortable situation. We don't, we don't know what the future is. For, does it have anything to do with what you said earlier about APIs in JavaScript? Mm -hmm. We'll see. So yeah, what are your thoughts on that? That's a good one. All right. <laughs> it's really probably the biggest existential question of our time. Um, for WordPress. I mean, there's other <laughs> big existential questions. <laughs> Is there a God? Why are we here? Can you write our pockets over together? <laughs> In terms of mobile, um, I would say it's something that WordPress hasn't adopted to so well yet. Um, it's difficult to build an open source community on a closed source platform. And that's really been really tricky for us. And from a user experience point of view, again, people don't care whether it's open or not, they care whether it's better. Um, native apps provide better experiences today. And kind of for the foreseeable future, um, call that three years out, um, it's possible that maybe an Ubuntu or Firefox powered platform could sort of bring the web back to the forefront. Um, but not looking super likely at this moment. It really looks like we're going to have a duopoly of uh, mobile operating systems. Um, I'm not terribly bullish on Tizen or some of these other ones that are coming out. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce it. Um, so what does WordPress do in this world? Uh, well, first, I think that the, the mobile web is still very important. And the reports of the mobile web's death are largely exaggerated. Um, there was a flurry survey that came out came out and said something like 85% of time on, on phones is spent in apps, not on the web. Um, but they made a, there were two big mistakes in that. First, you have to take out games, because that doesn't, almost doesn't count. Um, then, it turns out that they weren't counting web views inside of applications. So, if you're someone who uses Twitter, and you, you know, browse, you sort of click through for 10 seconds, and then you spend five minutes reading an article that you click through to, you really just spent five minutes on the web and 30 seconds inside an app, but it's being counted as five and a half minutes in the Twitter app by their methodology. So I think that they are, and this is something we see in our traffic as well, that they are drastically underestimating the amount of mobile web views that happen uh, driven by Facebook, Twitter, and other applications. Um, so that's the mobile web. In terms of how do we live in this world, uh, well, we're taking what's worked well, which is being more open than anyone else out there, and seeing whether that's going to work. So we have these apps. Uh, they don't have a ton of community contributions, but we are increasing the sort of automatician contributions more and more. Um, actually, uh, most automatic developers who are currently PHP or JavaScript guys are learning either Android or iOS development. So we're going to go from 15 to 100 mobile developers. Um, They'll be new, <laughs> but they'll, uh, you know, we're sort of recognizing that as the future of things. Um, we're doing APIs first for everything we build out, and we're designing. Whenever we design something new, we design it as fully responsive, which has the side effect of you design for every viewport size, whether it's you know, iPhone, Android, weird Samsung thing, <laughs> tablet, <laughs> yeah. all the way up to cinema display, right? And so we design all those at the same time and think of the interactions and the flows and how does it work on touch. And so this sort of, at the very least, will have a web version first, but then the native implementations we start to catch up with. Um, so we're doing kind of, call it a, a web first responsive development, which is then driving the native sort of 
speedy and performance implementations of it to follow. And, uh, and then seeing what happens. <laughs> the thing that I'm not entirely sure about is whether we will ever use apps and interlink apps the same way that we use in interlink websites. So let's say, let's talk about my blog. And we got TT. I think it's a lovely blog. You should all subscribe and visit it. <laughs> <laughs> but would you ever, like maybe you'll visit my blog after tonight or something because you hear me talk. But would you also install an app for that blog? You know? Or the dozens of things you follow? Um, it doesn't feel like it, particularly the way the app stores currently work. And to be honest, I mean, cool, there's 800,000 apps out there. Like, I use 20 of them. <laughs> I have like 100 installed. I actually use like 20 of them or 8 of them. You know, there's a real long tail of apps that just no one uses out there. And there's a lot of content sites that have created apps that no one uses. Um, so I'm way more interested about how we can sort of iterate the website of it to drive those, whether it's mobile web views or browser usage. Um, so it should be a better, better experience, and be touch aware, and be super fast, and everything. So uh, that's what we're working on. The the thing that's most important, though, is that uh, it's always Docker's before the dawn. You know, the, I feel like we're at sort of a nadir of openness on the web, both between the social networks and through the Twitters and Facebooks of the world, which are just you know, Twitter turns off, or changes its API, turns off its RSS feeds. They want, because they're advertising driven, they try to bring, bring more and more people of your attention and eyeballs in their little wall garden where they can sell ads to you, or basically sell you to advertisers. If you're not paying for the product, you are the product. <laughs> it's a good rule of thumb. Um, and the mobile platforms. Um, and that's it, the mobile platforms seem to be opening up. iOS 8, which I stupidly installed on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> And it crashes every time I take a picture. <laughs> uh, every time I watch one of those keynotes, like I undergo like a temporary psychosis. <laughs> I feel like it's like, you know how they say that when women give birth to a child, it's such a painful process that their bodies actually, there's an evolutionary thing where they release like an enzyme that helps them forget how much it hurt. Because otherwise no one ever have, would ever have a second child. Um, this is actually, that's a real thing. I didn't make that up. So I have that for installing beta versions of like, <laughs> and, and iOS. So I still do. Um, but they're doing some cool things, especially around interop linking and creating defaults. And now we can have a share button in there, just alongside the one that they decided to build into the operating system. You can create widgets and notifications. I mean, some of the stuff that's in there is actually, now, to be fair, Android had it for like two years. But coming to iOS is actually really, really exciting. And then the, the other side of it is this that we deserve an open web. You know, and we have to fight for it. We have to build it. Um, we have to make something better. So regardless of what you know, the VCs are investing in and what gets the most coverage on TechCrunch today and everything else, um, you have to, to go on be the change you want to be in the world. So uh, that's something that everyone here in the room can do. Uh, encourage people, restaurant, if, if your favorite restaurant has just a Facebook page, help them get a website too. You can get some free food out of it. You know, if, if you see, uh, well, hopefully the, the trend of putting like Twitter handles on billboards is the same as putting AOL keyboards on billboards. Like, it'll go away over time. Um, people should be, end of the day, you should be master of your own domain. <laughs> if you don't own your domain, if you don't have software that you can actually peek under the hood that and see how it works, you have the four freedoms. You're a digital sharecropper in someone else's domain. And you're ultimately at the mercy of their business model, their whims, their ups and downs. And as we've seen time and time and time again, these services go out of business, or their business models change, or they start, they lose things, or they get hacked, or it doesn't, it's not really yours at the end of the day, it's someone else's. And so um, I want to live in a web that belongs to all of us, because that's what made the web great in the beginning, and that's what WordPress aims to make more. So thank you guys very much. It's been a pleasure.
Yeah, based on many Singapore football. No durians? I like durians. <laughs> <laughs> So those fine city kind of t-shirts. Yeah. So, um, are you gonna put it on now? <laughs> <laughs> oh well, if it's too big, it will not be too big after this trip. <laughs> 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 I'm eating so much food. I actually went to the what's the Holland Market, Holland, uh, Holland Village. I went to the Holland Village today and got some of the food. And then yesterday, I actually got street food in Jakarta, and I survived. <laughs> Thank you.